Yes. Okay, test, test. Great. Hey, everybody. Good Monday morning. Hope everybody had a good weekend. So really happy to welcome Bolu Ajiboye, visiting us from Case Western uh, University. So Bolu did his undergrad uh, at Duke. Try not to hold that against him. He's, he's actually a reasonable person before um, moving on to do his, his PhD at Northwestern. Um, and he's had his lab at Case Western uh, since 2009? Uh, 2012. 2012, apologies. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So yeah. interestingly, uh, we started up in, in the BrainGate program around the same time where I was joining as a postdoc and Baloo was had the crazy idea of as an assistant <laughs> professor starting up a intracortical BCI clinical trial site. So um, he'll probably uh, be able to tell you some horror stories of that. But as you can see, he made it through alive and has done some of the most pioneering work uh, in not just intracortical BCI, but tackling the problem of connecting intracortical BCIs to restoring the movement of uh, paralyzed limbs, which ultimately, you know, I think is really where uh, you know people with paralysis want to go. They don't necessarily want to control robotic arms, but they would really love to be able to uh, to control their own limbs. And it's such a such a daunting problem. So it's been amazing to see Baloo, you know, kind of lead, lead the way in this field and now further push to, you know, reconnecting uh, sensory feedback. Um, so really excited, really thankful to have Baloo here. Please welcome him. Wonderful. Thank you, thank you everybody. Thank you, Chathan, for the invitation. Um, I have a lot of personal ties to this area and so I'm glad to get back uh, to this area. And, and uh, again, I give you just a flavor of some of the work that we're doing in Cleveland. Um, so um, I am part of a center known as the Functional Electrical Stimulation Center of Excellence. It's actually a collaboration of a number of institutions, you know, the University of Case Western Reserve, where I'm primary faculty, but also a number of our hospitals, um, university hospitals, the Cleveland Clinic, our VA medical center, and then off the map, there's a Metro Health uh, Medical Center. And these, these hospitals working together allow us to actually tackle this problem of looking at how do we restore movement back to people uh, with chronic spinal cord injury. Now, the center's been around for over 30 or so years, um, tackling this very hard, very hard problem, developing a technology known as functional electrical stimulation, which essentially uses uh, um, small currents to reanimate paralyzed limbs. My lab's focus is, is combining FES with a technology known as a BMI, a brain machine interface, ultimately to reconnect the hand um, and arm back to the brain. So what I'm, gonna, what I'm gonna talk about today is just give you a flavor of some of the translational work that we've been doing. And then at the very end, um, also talk about some of the work that we're doing in terms of using this model to understand uh, underlying mechanisms of brain function related to encoding of movement and sensation. Um, so as I mentioned, um, functional electrical stimulation, as uh, we, our center has been doing it for about 30 or, 30 or so years. And essentially it, it, it speaks the language of the nervous system, as we say. Um, you, what you see here are many different applications of FES to restoring lost function, either in the upper extremity for, for, for restoration of reaching and grasping, which is what I work on, um, all the way to lower extremity applications in terms of restoring standing, uh, gait. Um, we have applications in the central nervous system related to DBS for Parkinson's and treating depression and, and things of that nature. So essentially FES, as we say, speaks the language of the nervous system and can be used to address uh, many uh, neurological injuries and diseases. What you see on the right here are different technologies that are used to interface with the nervous system. So um, some of you may be familiar with using surface electrical stimulation for, for causing muscle contraction, um, all the way to more invasive options where we have electrodes either directly um, in the nerve, so penetrating the nerve itself, um, electrodes which surround the nerve itself. And this is one of the technologies that I'll talk about that we're using in our current application. Spinal cord stimulation is also another direct application of FES. But the point being, again, that we can use um, direct interfacing with the tissue to activate uh, many of these circuits. So what you'll see here is, so this is actually probably a 15-year-old 
uh, device called an implantable simulator 12 because there are 12 channels uh, emanating from it. You see a person with a high cervical level as a C1 spinal cord injury who has uh, this ISC-12 implanted, which consists of intramuscular and maybe some uh, cuff electrodes to activate, uh, to, act to activate nerves of the upper extremity. And using this system, we can restore basic movements of the upper extremity. So in this case, she's able to grasp um, an object between the thumb and the index finger. We're able to produce flexion, extension of the wrist and movements of, of the elbow as well. Um, now, in this case, what you'll see is the way that this system's operated is there's an external control module, which is pressed by the operator. Upon pressing a button, that initiates stimulation, causing contraction um, to, to produce movement. What my lab is interested in working on is how do we actually give volitional control back to these users so that you don't need um, an operator pressing an, extern an external button. The problem is that current systems rely on having some residual or volitional ac activity that the person can perform um, and capture to be able to produce, uh, to be able to initiate stimulation. But as you get uh, with higher, as you get with, as you have higher and higher levels of injury, there are fewer and fewer options for residual control. So if the person is able to have like a contralateral shoulder movement in the case of trying to restore unilateral, uh, you know, unilateral function. If they have contralateral shoulder movements, if you can capture EMG of the, you know, of the platysma, so the neck muscles or the auricularis behind the ear, um, if you can capture that activity, um, then you can use that to initiate stimulation. But um, that in and of itself um, presents limited options for restoring um, high degree of freedom uh, movement control to people, particularly people with, with high cervical spinal cord injury resulting in, in tetraplegia. Our, our working hypothesis essentially is that if we can actually capture the native circuits um, in the cortex underlying movement, uh, we have the potential to restore both volitional control um, and high degree of freedom control to people with high cervical spinal cord injury. So that's, so that's our goal. Okay, so our first foray into this was about in 2014. Uh, we recruited an individual with a C4 um, cervical spinal cord injury. Um, he, he had motor complete paralysis below the neck um, and he received a couple of different implants. So in the brain, he received two microelectrode arrays um, implanted in the hand knob area of primary motor cortex, just along the central sulcus. Um, and additionally, he received about 36 fine wire electrodes uh, in, in, implanted inside individual muscles to restore uh, restore grasping, reaching, uh, uh, elbow flexion extension, and elbow movements as well. Um, in this case, what we were hoping to do is look is essentially look at the underlying cortical uh, modulation that occurred when he was imagining performing different movements, extension, flexion, grasping, et cetera. We wanted to capture those and then use those to connect them to re movements restored through the electrical stimulation or through the activation um, of, the, of the individual muscles. Now, obviously prior, uh, because of his injury, he had been injured for uh, eight years prior to joining our study, there had been a lot of uh, muscle atrophy that had occurred. And so to build his muscle uh, strength back up to build resistance to fatigue, we actually ended up having to exercise him or exercise him when he was um, not part of, when he was not actively engaged in our study again, to build the muscle strength. So essentially, uh, we have this microelectrode array, um, which is you know, a commercial device made by a company uh, called BlackRock, um, which penetrates the cortex about one and a half millimeters in depth, which allows us to record single unit action potential. So we're pinging the brain about 30,000 times a second. I'm going to record the activity of individual neurons. And what we're interested in is mapping that activity, we actually um, extract features, either the rate of the firing rate, which we call the threshold crossing rate, or the spectral power in a 250 to 5K band. We map that through just a linear function to um, stimulation patterns. Okay, so for each desired movement, so for example, if we want to restore hand opening closing, we have a pattern of muscle activations um, that, we're, th that results in each of these movements. So essentially map the features 
to uh, the stimulation pattern. And then, so we're decoding, essentially it's a derivative signal, Der decoding a derivative signal. We map it to the pattern of interest to results in the desired movements of interest. Now, so what you're gonna see here and hopefully, sorry, that's loud. How do I turn this down? <laughs> Uh, maybe I, I'll try turning my, let's try that. Okay, let's try that again. Okay, so what you're seeing here is, is our participant who we referred to as T8. You can see the percutaneous uh, interface of his two arrays. And, okay. And he's essentially, uh, what, what's going on here is he's imagining uh, movements, a two degree of freedom ex uh, exercise here. So he's imagining opening and closing his, his grasp. He's also ex imagining extending and flexing his elbow. Uh, the electrodes are stimulating his arm to reanimate those movements. We're also capturing the kinematics of the movement. So this will play again. We're capturing the kinematics of the movements and then replaying them or recreating them in this virtual environment. So the opaque arm is mimicking what his actual arm is doing. And then we're actually presenting, if you can see um, in a little bit, we're actually presenting targets as in here, targets in the workspace. And his goal is to match the arm position. And this allows us essentially to assess his uh, BMI performance of his actual FES limb. Every time, every, every time you hear one of those dings, he's hitting the two degree of freedom targets, right? So he's able to position the elbow um, and position uh, the grasp appropriately. So what you can see here again is that, again, we're decoding uh, elbow patterns. So the elbow angle, one more time, and the aperture angle or aperture velocity, if you will. And then we're essentially integrating them to create the, the movement of interest. Basic performance metrics, if we look at his ability to hit the target, so this is, um, okay, so if we look at his basic uh, ability to hit the targets, each dot represents basically his, uh, his attempt in either controlling the elbow, the wrist, the hand or the shoulder in one degree of freedom. We see by and large that he's able to hit the targets quite well. His movement times are a little bit variable, but again, he's able to achieve the goal of, of the training task. Um, looking at two degrees of freedom control, his performance is a little bit worse than single degree of freedom, single degree of freedom control, but that's to be expected. Um, and then if we look at trajectories in virtual reality where he's controlling just the animation versus FES, again, the FES trajectories are a little bit uh, less uh, straight, but in general, again, he can still hit the targets when he's controlling movements of his own arm in this space. So then we start to ask the question, how could he actually use these movements um, to perform um, an activity of daily living? You know, things that you and I do every day. So in this, in the top left video, he's, he's attempting to grasp a cup of coffee, bring it to his face and take a drink. In the bottom right video, one of the things that he wanted to be able to do is feed himself a bowl of mashed potatoes. And so we have him again, being able to grasp an object, control, flex and extension. He's, there's actually also a mobile arm support to support the weight of his arm against gravity, which moves his arm up and down. But the movements of that mobile arm support, or move, mobile arm support are also under direct volitional uh, cortical control as well. So, you know, a number of times he's able to complete the task readily um, in, in less than a minute in terms of being able to grasp the cup and bring it to his face. What was most encouraging is that he himself says that, you know, when he thinks about moving the arm, it's not cognitively burdensome. He's able to uh, think about moving his arm from point A to point B. His arm responds with, with little lag and he's able to complete the task um, again with little cognitive burden. So that was encouraging to us. But there's some challenges. There were some challenges with the systems. Again, this was 2014 to about 2017. Um, some of the challenges of the system are the following. So one, as I mentioned, we used an intramuscular electrodes, um, each one having to be surgically placed individually, um, which will allow us to activate many of the different uh, muscles in the forearm related to hand and arm function. Um, and so that, you know, that is surgically burdensome. And so we are looking for ways to mitigate that. Um, because of this technology, because of the microelectro, because of the uh, intramuscular electrodes, 
Um, it actually, there's a high current requirement for muscle activation. You know, we would, on the order of about 10 milliamps, you'd have to pump into each electrode to create uh, the, the, the requisite muscle activations. We would like to be able to reduce this by, as, by an order of magnitude. So um, in the next iteration, which I'll talk about in a second, we've actually, we're actually using a different uh, electrode technology to reduce the current requirements, which would also reduce the, the um, propensity for fatigue also in, increase chronic uh, tissue health. Another limitation of the present system or the system that I just described is that the person only has visual feedback. They have to watch their arm and their hand as they grasp objects um, to understand when they make contact, um, to get a sense of how much force they're exerting. And so we would like to be able to create a system that introduces uh, somatosensory feedback in a, in a bi-directional manner. Um, and then, you know, one of the uh, big challenges with many of these systems is that there's a percutaneous interface, both on the periphery for FVS, but then also cortically as well. And so we're not addressing the interface right now. Um, there are a number of labs that are developing, uh, you know, moving towards fully implanted or telemetered systems. But the, but the new version of the system, version two, which I'll describe now, is focused on addressing um, some of those, you know, those first three uh, limitations. Okay, so in 2019, we established what we call the Rehab Clinical Trial, which stands for Reconnecting the Hand and Arm to the Brain, specifically to address some of the issues that I, that I, that I just articulated. The goal of this rehab, the goal, the goal of this clinical trial is to create a bidirectional interface that allows both to sense the brain using uh, these cortical implants, but then also to, to stimulate the brain using uh, intracortical microstimulation to give the somatosensory feedback, uh, the perception of touch that, that I'll, I'll, I'll talk about in a minute. So in our recent participants, so he's also high cervical spinal cord injury, C4 Asia B, meaning that he's motor complete below the neck. He has some retained sensation um, of his hand um, and his forearm, which we've actually been able to leverage in ways that I'll, that I'll describe later. Um, but our goal in, in this person and in, in similar people is to basically be able to record from uh, motor arrays. And also we've actually implanted in inferior frontal gyrus, which is close to premotor areas, um, parietal cortex. We want to record and decipher movement intent from those arrays. We're stimulating in primary somatosensory cortex to give this, you know, to give the uh, tactile percept uh, back to the individual. And then instead of the intramuscular electrodes, we're using uh, what we call uh, composite flat interface or C-fine electrodes, which essentially wrap around the nerve. Um, and if we're, since we're stimulating the nerve, we're actually using you know, one milliamp and, and less of, of current to, to, to activate uh, movement, um, which again, has benefits for tissue health and mitigating a muscle fatigue. Uh, these are also multi-contact electrodes. So each, each C-fine has about uh, 15 stimulatable contacts, which allows us to potentially address individual fascicles uh, to produce um, you know, many of the movements that you see here. So with just eight, uh, eight cuffs implanted in the upper arm, our goal has been to be able to uh, reanimate many of these movements in isolation. Um, one of my areas of focus is restoring dexterous hand function as well. So the ability to restore uh, movement of individuated fingers. Um, and so that was one of our goals, which we haven't achieved yet, but something that we're working towards using this cuff technology. Okay, so um, one of the things that we're concerned about in the field um, often is uh, chronic, the chronic uh, tissue health or the, the health of the tissue electrode interface. Um, so, um, so what we see here, just spike panels, we see that we had decent yields. It's just one of our arrays. I believe this is in the this array is in uh, the premotor area, inferior frontal gyrus. So you see our spike panels, we're able to record single unit activity from much of, from much of the array. Uh, over our six arrays, I believe we're looking at about a couple hundred single units. Um, and so we're getting a decent, a decent yield. Um, like most people, what we see is that over time, um, on the x-axis here, we have days post implant, we have unit count on the y-axis. We do tend to see generally a decrease in our, in our yield count. This is part of the reason we're actually looking at the spectral power as well, which tends to be more stable over time. Um, and but our you know our SNRs are pretty strong, right? So we felt like we had pretty decent yields for our arrays. Uh, 
um, one of the things that we had to figure out exactly where to place the arrays. So, um, so this is an image of the participant's brain, posterior on the right, anterior on the left. Um, we have the central sulcus. Intraoperatively, we wanted to map out where to place the somatosensory arrays. So, so we actually, uh, we had an awake craniotomy. The participant was awake during, uh, during a portion of the surgery. And then using just a handheld Ojiwan stimulator, we're able to apply uh, milliamp levels of current to different portions of cortex, have him respond what he feels. So um, intraoperatively, you know, the different colors show how, you know, what he responded in terms of what fingers he felt um, being touched. Um, also uh, in front, in, in inferior frontal gyral area, we were looking to avoid brocus area. We did not want to implant necessarily in a speech area. We were looking for more premotor activity. So again, we avoided areas that caused speech arrest, implanted air with, in an area which, which had no speech arrest. And then our M1 arrays and pride arrays were implanted basically based upon anatomical landmarks. Okay. Um, I think uh, Sam asked me earlier about the craniotomy that we did. Um, we actually did a single craniotomy. It's, maybe it's a little bit challenging to see um, in this, this image, but we actually did a single craniotomy to expose the entire, you know, all areas of cortex, which had its pros and cons. You know, it was good from a surgical perspective, uh, from a surgical standpoint. Um, doing this again, we'd probably look at smaller craniotomies around the premotor area, and then probably one um, encompassing uh, the M1S1 and perhaps parietal. So one of the first things we're interested in is what is, you know, what do these units modulate to? More specifically, do they modulate to the movements of interest when our person is imagining performing these different movements? So uh, just as a first pass, we had him imagine performing several different grasp patterns because our goal again is to restore a uh, functional grasping. So um, this is just shows the response of a single electrode um, in, in pre-motor area. We had him perform a task where you know, at about one and a half, one and a half seconds prior to movement onset, we cued him with a visualization of a grasp. Um, at zero seconds, we asked him to imagine performing that grasp. And what we were looking at is the cortical modulation, um, both in the pre-movement phase and also in the movement phase. And so we see, you know, fortunately, you know, distinct and differentiable modulation to different grasp patterns. And again, this is just one exemplary, uh, exemplary electrode in the inferior frontal gyrus. Interestingly enough, what we actually see and what is consistent with, uh, with what, what other groups has recently reported is this idea of a whole body map. So not only are you know, hand, you know, hand functions and grasp functions encoded in, in these cortical signals, we can actually get um, a map of, the, of, of several different movements of, of movements of different body segments, including the mouth, the lower extremities of the leg, even though we are, impl we are implanted nominally, in, in, in hand knob area. So we get a pretty decent um, offline decode of, of the whole body map. Um, but again, our primary focus is on looking at um, functions of the hand. Okay, so I mentioned earlier that we were looking at, um, we were doing intraoperative mapping to figure out uh, where to implant the sensory arrays. And so you can see where we decided to implant our arrays. Um, we tried as much as possible to be consistent with the, intra with the intraoperative results, um, but at the same time needing to avoid some of the vasculature um, for obvious reasons. What we were interested in looking at is that, you know, chronically though, what did the participant report? You know, what was what we call um, this projected field map uh, when we actually stimulated the array? So we applied, you know, anywhere between 20 to 80 microamp levels of current to different electrodes on both the medial and lateral array and simply ask the participant, where, what do you feel? You know, what do you feel? And so what you see here is a color-coded map of where he reported um, feeling perceptions of touch um, on either the front of the back, the front of the hand or the back of the hand and, and where on the arrays, um, you know, he, uh, where on, what portions of the array evoked these responses. Now, what we tended to find is that um, these were somatotopically organized, as we would expect. Um, we didn't get a lot of yield. You know, the, the responses tended to be, the projective fields tended to be focused in specific corners of the array, which were consistent, of course, with where uh, they were placed um, in the cortex. 
Um, but the take home point or the important point was that he was, he was able to reliably respond that he felt as if you were squeezing his finger um, consistently um, with stimulation of each of these, uh, each of these um, uh, channels. So we actually decided now, you know, can we actually do what we call a discrimination task where if we stimulate specific uh, channels of the electrode, can he, can he reliably report um, what channels, uh, in, in essence, what finger we stimulated? And then can he, also can he also report the magnitude of stimulation, a low, medium, high? So what you're gonna see here is a video that's not playing. Um, let me see if I can play this video. Does that work? Yep. Okay. So what you'll see here is the operator, our student, uh, Brianna Hutchinson, is, is going to select different parameters, as you'll see on the screen. And then our RP1, his job is basically to report where he feels it. So he's able to report both Uh, let's try that again. So he's able to report both location and also the, the strength of the first step as well. Apologies, I don't know why the video is skipping, but I think you get the essence of it. So let's let's uh, stop that. Okay, so okay, so the take home message here is he is able to report both the location and the intensity of stimulation. And in fact, if we actually plot the um, normalized pulse amplitude that we're you know, applying to, to the channels. Um, we, were pl we plot his, what he reports is this perceived intensity. You see, as you'd expect, generally speaking, a monotonically increasing response um, to the normalized pulse amplitude. And if we ask him again um, to report the location based upon the electrode or the intensity based upon, you know, based upon the pulse amplitude, he generally is able to reliably report uh, re respond to both location and intensity quite well. So that's encouraging for using this um, in a bi-directional bi system. The other thing we're interested in is on the peripheral side, um, you know, what is the response? You know, do the cuffs actually promote uh, a motor response? So I mentioned we have eight cuffs implanted um, in the upper arm and you can see here, um, Apologies for the graphic uh, image, but you can see here the cuff here surrounding sur surrounding the peripheral nerve. Um, on these on these X-ray images, you can see the different cuffs are outlined in red. We have a number of inline connectors which allow us basically to bring the the uh, the the wires out um, to to the outside world and connect to our external stimulator. But again, what we're interested in is what is the motor response. Um, when we stimulate different cuffs, so we have axillary musculocutaneous, muscul radial, median, and other, and other um, cuffs, what is the motor response associated with stimulating each individual contact? And so you can see we get a number of robust motor responses of finger like flexion extension, thumb activation. Uh, we're able to get forearm pronation supination on certain cuffs, um, elbow flexion extension, and, and even uh, movements of the shoulder. What was surprising, um, what we did not, did not expect is that many of these cuffs also produce sensation. So when we stimulated certain cuffs, he actually responded that he felt um, tingling, if you will, or kinesthesia in the, for, in the forearm. Um, that's because again, these cuffs essentially flatten the nerve. So they, well, they gently reshape is the, is the company line that we say, it gently reshapes the nerve to expose a different fascicles, some of which are sensory fascicles. And so, Stimulation of some of the contacts also produced a sensory response as well, 
um, which will actually allow us to, um, which will actually leverage um, as I'll describe later. But for now, what we're interested in is quantifying the motor response um, of these, um, uh, 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 motor response to cuff stimulation. So we, we can actually measure the EMG response of simulating a single cuff. Uh, we essentially rectify it and look at the area under the curve to give us a quantified metric of the, of the muscle response um, to stimulation. And what we generate are what we call recruitment curves. So on the, on the x-axis, we have percents. Uh, we have basically the pulse width that we're modulating. On the y-axis is the normalized EMG response, taken as the area under the rectified curve. Um, and what we, and basically what we're looking for, what we're trying to quantify are the recruitment recurves for each contact at different pulse amplitudes. So modulating the pulse amplitude is oftentimes gonna change the steepness of the recruitment curve, um, but we need to first quantify this so that we can then later begin to figure out how to simultaneously uh, combine stimulation of these contacts to produce subsequent movements. So what we have plotted here are for, you know, for our median radial and ulnar cuff, basically the muscles that are activated, I mean, each of the colors represents a different muscle, the muscles that are activated by each contact, um, the muscles that are recruited you know, from stimulation. Recruitment order starts, uh, first muscle recruited is towards the center, last muscle recruited is towards the periphery, towards the outside. And so what we see in many cases is spatial selectivity of muscles. So for example, in this case, uh, brachioradialis muscles are recruited more readily by the left side of the radial of, of the radial cuff as opposed to the right side. Um, similarly, um, thumb muscles in the ulnar in the ulnar cuff in the ulnar cuff are recruited more readily on the right side of the cuff or on the bottom half of the cuff than the top half of the cuff. And so we tend to see spatial selectivity again because the fascicles have been reshaped or reorganized, um, and then we're able to um, we're able to actively select actively stimulate uh, certain fascicles um, you know, over over others. If we plot the recruitment thresholds, so these plots represent the 20% uh, activation thresholds um, of each muscle, we can actually get a sense of how the nerve is sitting inside the cuff. So in this case, you know, the recruitment thresholds tend to be lower on the left half of the cuff than the, top, than the right half of the cuff, which suggests to us that the muscle in this particular case is probably biased towards the left half. Um, one of the decision points that we made was to use the same size cuff um, regardless of the, of the nerve, of the, the nerve size that we use. And the reason we did that was for translational purposes. We didn't want to have to get, I um, you know, five different size cuffs and figure out the optimal cuff size um, intraoperatively. So we actually made a decision to use a single cuff size for all nerves. Um, some, it fits some nerves better than others, better than others obviously. Um, but, you know, the take home point is that because of the way the nerve sits, that obviously biases the activation threshold um, and the way, the manner in which the fascicles are reshaped and, um, and the manner in which that the muscles are activated. Now, using a single cuff, you know, what, what our goal for, for uh, using the cuff electrodes was to get selectivity of individual muscle activations. That, that would be nice. It'd be nice to simulate a single contact to be, to be able to get flexor digitorum specifically or index finger movements as opposed to thumb movements. That's not exactly what we saw. So that was a little bit of a disappointment. Um, but what we did see is that even stimulation of a single contact would actually produce movement of multiple degrees of freedom, multiple joints, okay? And so we can actually get, um, you know, simulating median contact, we can get, uh, we can get uh, flexion um, of, the, of, of many degrees of freedom. Similarly, stimulating the radial contact, we can get extension of many different degrees of freedom independently. Uh, extension of many different degrees of freedom. Um, what we want to do, though, is not just stimulate single contacts, but look at how do we simulate multiple contacts to produce functional movements, and that's what we're working on presently. Um, it's a very hard problem. You know, right now, the way that we're approaching it is we have an individual with 20 or so years of, of, of expertise essentially tweaking knobs um, fit to figuring out what is the right balance of stimulation of individual contacts to produce the functional movement of interest. It's not very systematic, not very uh, translatable um, or portable to, uh, to other, other sites or other participants. 
we are thinking about, you know, are there ways that we can use computational approaches um, to think about how to combine uh, multiple contacts? Um, if we think about the response of a, of a complement of muscles, so single contact as a muscle synergy, there are ways previously that, that, that we've looked at in terms of how to optimally combine muscle synergies to produce complex, uh, complex uh, activities. And so there are some approaches, you know, based upon muscle synergy analysis that we're looking at as to how to combine uh, multi-contact uh, stimulation. But nevertheless, and hopefully these videos play, what you're gonna see here are videos of him performing various uh, movements um, that we've been able to have him perform. So in this video, actually I'll let him, I'll let him talk. So that's him performing uh, just a simple grasp control uh, task of his own volition. Um, in this video, what you'll see here is him performing a grasp and eating task. Uh, my videos aren't playing. Let's try this. All right, there we go. So he does have difficulty acquiring objects on his own. So we do have to place it in his hand, um, but then he's able to perform a flexion task and, and he has enough range of motion to be able to bring it to his mouth to produce, uh, to, to eat it. And then he can actually extend back and forth multiple times to take multiple bites. And then in this video, this is him doing um, a handshaking task, which uh, you know, he hadn't shaken his dad's hand, you know, in his in eight years. Um, he's able to, of course, extend his elbow, open his hand, and then squeeze and produce different gradations of force um, to produce this handshake activity. So this is the translational goal that we're working towards, being able to give him the ability to perform many of these activities of daily living that, again, you and I do uh, do regularly. Uh, okay, so, um, uh, okay, how am I doing on time? 20 minutes? Yeah. Okay, so in the remaining time, um, I just want to, so, you know, our primary goal is translational, you know, be able to um, develop these systems, deploy these systems, um, but in the remaining time, I do want to, uh, maybe in the next 10 or 15 minutes, talk about some of the things, some of the ways that we can actually use this model to learn something about how the brain works and specifically how the brain represents, um, you know, how the brain encodes movements, um, specifically multidimensional dexterous movements, as well as how the brain represents uh, somatosensory inputs. Um, so I mentioned earlier that our participant has an incomplete spinal cord injury um, on, on, the, on the sensory side. He actually probably has about 50 to 60% of retained sensation, particularly of his fingertips. Now we can leverage this to begin to ask questions about, um, number one, how the brain represents a natural touch. So we can touch his, his, his hand and, and then cortically we can record the response. Additionally, remember I mentioned earlier that the, that the cuff electrodes that we're using produce both a motor response and a sensory response. So additionally, we can actually perform what's called peripheral nerve stimulation. We can modulate the intensity of the input. And again, we can record the cortical response 
and additionally, additionally ask him what is what is the what is his perceptual response? How does it feel when you do per peripheral nerve stimulation versus intact uh, touching his finger versus intracortical micro microstimulation of somatosensory cortex? So, in this first experiment, um, one of our students, uh, Brianna Hutchinson, did an experiment where she basically used the tactor to to interrogate um, different fingers on his hand in which he had you know, semi-intact sensation. Um, essentially the tactor, she would apply a stimulus, uh, a mechanical stimulus, a trapezoidal mechanical stimulus, varying either the, the rate of the inputs uh, of the stimulus or the depth of, of, of the input as well. And again, the goal is to look at what is the cortical response to modulating the rate and, and or the depth um, of, the, of the mechanical inputs. Um, and so what we see are a few things. So one, um, depending on which finger you interrogate, so whether or not you apply the tactile to the thumb, index, middle ring, pinky, you would see a different spatial pattern of activation on the array. And again, this makes sense, right? So, um, you know, so orange, for example, are the electrodes which were active uh, beyond their baseline um, to, to indexing the index finger and, and the various colors as well. Now, what we do see is that there tends to be, this is what we call a, a, rece a receptive field, right? So we, so we apply mechanical stimulus to the hand, we get a receptive field on the array. In contrast with the projected field, we were stimulating the array and looking at what parts of the array resulted in a perceptive touch. Um, thankfully, we do see a strong or significant overlap between the receptive field maps that we see here and the projected field maps that, that, I, that I mentioned previously. So that's number one. Number two, we tend to see what we call a derivative response in the, in, in the cortical activity, right? So this dotted line represents the, the profile of the tactor that's applied to the finger. What we tend to see is an onset response, a large onset response when the, when the tactor makes initial uh, contact with the finger and indents the finger. Um, less so, um, we tend to see a slight offset response but in the middle, the, the, the electrodes tend to, return to, tend to return to baseline. So this is what we call a derivative response. Um, this is important because uh, when, you know, there are groups who are looking at what are the optimal ways to apply microstimulation to the cortex in a biomimetic way. And so rather than just applying a constant train of, 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 of stem pulses, they are looking at ways to essentially recreate this, this derivative this derivative response, this onset response, offset response, and seeing if that has um, efficacy for, for enhancing uh, the cortical, cortical, cortical activation. Okay, so again, we see a spatial response, we see a derivative response temporally. Um, and then what we also see is that, you know, we can vary the depth of the tactor. So either, oh, sorry, we can vary the rate of the tactor input. So whether it's a slow rate, all the way to a fast rate that also modulates the peak, this, the peak spiking activity um, on this, again, this one particular elect exemplary electrode. We can also modulate the depth. So if going from shallow to deep, that again also modulates the peak, the peak uh, spiking activity or the peak power um, of, this, of the spike response. And then again, we tend to see across increasing depth and increasing rate, if we plot that against spike power, generally monotonically increasing response um, in the cortex. Um, and that, and what we also see is that there is a generally monotonically increasing response when we try it, when we compare basically the spike power to his perception as well. So when he says, oh, you, you, that was a strong indentation versus light indent indentation, that tends to correlate fa fairly well to the peak power um, that's recorded um, in, in the spike response, okay? I also mentioned that in addition to indenting, um, in addition to applying a mechanical stimulus, we can also apply an electrical stimulus in the periphery. So now using these cuff electrodes, um, a, a collaborator of mine showed previously that you can actually stimulate in the periphery and produce a perceptual response in people who had lost their limbs due to amputation. Um, this is the work of Dr. Dustin Tyler and Dr. Emily Grachik. I'm um, showing that you can create percepts of touch on various locations of the hand in people with amputations, because again, you've reshaped the nerve, um, allowing you to address individual fascicles um, and, and create a perceptual response. 
So we thought we could do the same. Okay, again, because we have somebody with an incomplete spinal cord injury, we can use peripheral nerve stimulation. We can use peripheral nerve stimulation. We apply peripheral nerve stimulation, record the cortical response, and again, and then ask the question, um, number one, what's the cortical response? Number two, what does he feel? You know, how did, and how does that compare to natural touch? So we apply uh, a train of pulses to various uh, cuffs um, in the upper arm. We, we basically apply um, sub-threshold and super-threshold um, uh, stimuli. So thresholds where he does not report a perceptual response and thresholds where he does report a perceptual, perceptual response. We essentially vary it along that axis, you know, sub-threshold to super-threshold. And again, look at what is the cortical response and, and how does, and what is, and how does he, and what does he feel? So generally, as we'd expect, number one, as we increase, you know, at up until a threshold, um, past a threshold, when we increase the pulse width that's being applied, uh, his, his intensity scales, you know, and this just shows for different electrodes that this is consistent. So that's, that's not surprising. Um, what we also saw is that again here, again on the y-axis, what we're plotting is the pulse width condition in different colors. This is a raster plot, so each dot represents um, spiking activity of, 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 uh, of, of individual neurons. What we have here is the stimulate, stimulus onset phase shown in, in, in yellow here, yellow box, at the stimulus offset phase. And what we again see again is this derivative response, right? So using peripheral nerve stimulation, um, at stimulus onset, you see this strong burst of neural activity. You see a not as strong burst, it's still a burst of neural activity at offset. And in the middle, again, you have this quiescent response as well. And again, the peak activity as you increase, um, as you increase the pulse width, the peak activity, as expected, uh, tends to tends to increase. Now, this is what we this is what we would call um, a rapidly adapting neural response, right? So we see a quick response and then it and then dies back down. Um, and this was characteristic of many of the units that, that we were recording from, but not all responses are rapidly adapting. Some are what we call slowly adapting, right? Where you did see a sustained response um, beyond, the, beyond the transient. Um, but again, the majority of responses did tend to have this, you know, burst, uh, this initial burst at onset and offset of, of simulation. And then just again, real quickly, what we see is again, again is as we increase the pulse width, we, send, we tend to see an increase in the mean baseline firing rate. Um, and and uh, I think these other graphs are basically saying the same thing. For different electrodes, again, as you increase the pulse width, you see an increase in the, in the mean baseline uh, of the firing rate. Uh, this basically shows the different electrodes, which again, the, the receptive field, the different electrodes which were active uh, when we did peripheral nerve stimulation. And again, the, the perceived intensity, what did he report, scaled you know, generally well with the, main, with the mean baseline firing rate. What is interesting is that when you ask him, what did he perceive, you know, comparing natural touch to, uh, to uh, the percept of the peripheral nerve stimulation, he reported that the peripheral nerve stimulation was very strong. He wrote the very strong percept but it felt very electrical. He reported kinesthesia often. Um, in contrast to his percept for intracortical microstimulation, um, he reported a very, very natural quality um, of direct stimulation of the brain. Now, it was, it, was, it was less robust than natural touch is what he reported. It didn't carry the same amount of information as touching his intact hand, but the quality of information he reported was, was more natural than peripheral nerve stimulation. Um, so that was, so what we're doing now is actually looking at being able to compare those three modalities of, of, of sensory restoration, looking at, again, what is a perceptual response, um, how do each of those promote sensory motor learning, um, and things of that nature. So those are some things that we're uh, working towards. Um, real quickly, I think I have maybe just a couple minutes, so maybe I'll just do one more, uh, one more topic here in the, in the last few minutes. One of the other things that we're interested in looking at is understanding representation of dexterous, dexterous hand function. Um, and um, in a previous participant, we were interested in looking at the neural responses or the neural activity during 
complex finger movements or multi-degree freedom finger movements. Um, so we had the individual, similar to previous videos that you saw before, perform this matching task where under, under cortical control, he's asked to position, in this case, the thumb and index finger um, in a two degree of freedom task. And again, every time you hear a ding, he's able to do that correctly. We're able to look at rasters, or again, the neural, the neural activity during imagining of different grass patterns or different individuated finger movements. And we're able, able to do an offline decode uh, of, the, of the responses and see that in general, we're able to differentiate whole hand movements or the movement or the movement, the imagined movements of individual fingers quite robustly. But we're also interested in understanding, you know, are single degree of freedom finger movements fundamentally the same or different than multi-degree of freedom finger movements? Um, so this is a, there's a question of what we call what are the underlying dynamics of, of, of the neural behavior? Um, a number of studies have looked at um, quantifying uh, the dynamics of, of, of a neural population during, you know, during movements of intact non-human primates. Seminal paper by Churchill and Atal, et which showed that if you take the multidimensional neural activity projected onto a lower dimensional manifold, the details, the details of which are necessarily important right now, what you tend to see is this very stereotypical uh, rotational dynamics associated with, associated with uh, arm movements. What we wanted to ask is, do we see these same sort of you know, uh, structured rotations when the individual is performing single, uh, single joint, you know, single finger movements? And then are they maintained when they also perform uh, multi-joint movements as, as well? So we had our participant do just that. So we had conditions where he imagined movements of the index and the thumb, and then also in combination, um, flexion extension of the thumb and index and many, and, many, and many other combinations. We looked at whether or not, you know, when we projected them onto this lower dimensional manifold space, was, did we see, again, these rotational structures and were they maintained in single finger versus multi-finger movements? Um, short answer is, again, this is just work that we're starting now. We, we do tend to see, again, when we project into this lower dimensional manifold space, these rotational structures, which seem to be consistent with, um, you know, consistent across many different movements. Um, when we compared the manifold, again, this lower dimensional space of single finger movements, so on the, uh, on the columns here, compared to multi-degree of freedom movements, what we looked at is essentially how well they aligned. And in short, what we saw is there was strong alignment between multi-degree of freedom movements that incorporated each single degree, single degree of freedom movement, as would, as would be expected, right? So when we have thumb flexion and thumb abduction, that tended to align well with th that manifold, tended to align well with manifolds that included single thumb flexions al as alone or uh, single thumb abductions as well. Okay, so, I mean, just getting started in this, in this vein, but this does give us a tool to understand how the population dynamics are similar or different um, when comparing single versus multi-degree of freedom movements. Um, one of the last things that I'll mention is that we're also interested in understanding not just how behaviors are occurring within a single network, but across networks and specifically across brain areas. You know, we have implanted arrays in at least four or five different areas of cortex. One of the things we would like to understand is what is the, how much, what information is shared during uh, between cortical areas, and one way that we're in, that we're interrogating that is using uh, a metric known as Granger causality, which many of you may be familiar with. So essentially, we have arrays implanted in multiple multiple cortices. Uh, we're looking at when we project the neural response to this lower dimensional manifold. Um, can we does the activity in one lower dimensional manifold tell us something about? the activity in another, another dimensional manifold in a Granger causal way. Um, so, um, and one of the reasons that we're very interested in doing that is because if we actually look at these three areas that we've been planted in, parietal, um, IFG, which is close to ventral premotor and M1, they form in non-human primates what is known as a grasp network. Uh, we wanna be able to quantify um, in our human participants whether or not, you know, how this grasp network behaves. So. In a simple cued move task, as I've described before, we have our we cue our participant with a particular movement, 
we have him prep for about one and a half seconds, and then we actually have him imagine performing the movement at time t equals zero. We can using Granger causality of, of and looking at how the manifolds um, how the manifolds share information. We can actually plot how the causal the causal relationship changes um, during the Q prep move activity. So what you see here is one example is in the dark blue the ca the causal response between inferior frontal gyrus and and parietal cortex, and in the light cyan or light green you see the bidirectional response as well, the, the, the causality in the opposite direction. And what we see and what we're starting to see is that the, the causality tends to be a specific to the epoch of movement. Um, one of the things that we've also seen, it also tends to be specific to the task. So, you know, this network would be more connected during a grasping activity and more specifically a, an active grasping activity as opposed to a passive grasp, grasping activity, as opposed to a non-grasping movement as opposed to a speech or, or a cognitive task. So we wanna use this tool as a way to tease out and interrogate what the connectivity is between these areas. Um, and again, this is just something that we're starting at, starting on now. So I think I'm out of time, I wanna leave some time for questions. Uh, just real quickly, I just want to uh, make sure to acknowledge the many people, many, many, many people who have been involved in this work over the many years. Um, this slide is a little bit old, you know, uh, Chafin is listed as an alum um, on somewhere down there. I can't just see where. Um, but yeah, just want to acknowledge the number of collaborators uh, between our institution. You know, we've worked very closely with Brown University when we were part of the BrainGate team, um, Stanford uh, as well. Uh, so I just want to acknowledge many people there. Um, and then also our lab funding agencies. And the last thing I'll say is that many years ago, we were fortunate to be part of a movie called I Am Human which um, talked about both the technology um, and the human side um, of the work that we do. So if I encourage you to take 90 minutes to, to watch that on Amazon or, or, or Hulu. Um, and with that, I'll end and take questions. Um, let's let's open the floor for questions. I want to be sensitive because I know we're up against uh, time here, so likely some people will need to file out, and that's okay. But I want to make sure you know folks have time to also ask Bolu some questions. So we'll start here. Thanks. Uh, it's so such great work, and really cool to see all the uh, firing in the in the brain that looks like all the stuff we've seen in animal work. I have a question about the stimulation in the peripheral nerve. You were saying you're getting groups. Do you think it's because the stimulation level is just too high and you're not as precise enough? Or is it that there's some anatomical kind of mixing of the um, nerves going to the various muscles? Yeah, so you're asking about the about the kinesthesia that, that he reports, is that what you're asking? When, when you're stimulating the muscles, you're saying you're at, Actually, for motor, for motor, you're okay. seeing multiple muscles activated. I see. Are you just stimulating too high, or are the nerves actually kind of yeah. in this fractal pattern like we see a motor cortex? Yeah, no, that's a good question. So um, it really so we notice that if you reduce the pulse amplitude of stimulation, you can get greater selectivity. You also get a less steep recruitment curve, um, and so there. And so you know we can modulate that to some degree. Um, but regardless, we sit because it all depends on the fascicular organization, right? So if we're not able, and, and so that's one thing. The second thing is we're not doing, we're not using advanced techniques such as, you know, like current steering, uh, which we could potentially do to greater isolate uh, fascicular activation. Um, so this is just a first, a first pass. So I do think, and other people have shown in other um, applications that with things such as current steering, you can get greater selectivity. Um, so that was, you know, so we're planning on doing that. Um, never, nevertheless, I do think there's still an opportunity to use the uh, synergistic muscle activations that we do see and see and figure out how to combine them into more complex movements. Um, and so that's what, that's what we're working on as well. Um, there's a question on Zoom. I'm going to repeat it here. This is from Trisha Kesar. Um, she says, great talk. I'm curious if stimulation over the somatosensory cortex elicits any other responses besides sensory perception, for example, motor evoked responses. 
It is purported that this metasensory cortex has origins of some corticomotor descending neurons as well. So I had, uh, it's hard to hear a little bit. Does the somatosensory stimulation cause M1 evoked um, responses? Cause any other responses besides sensory perception? For example, motor evoked responses. Um, so because of the connections between M1 and S1, we do see some motor evoked responses. Um, one of the things that we're trying to tease out is what is artifact, right? Because obviously if you stimulate on uh, an S1 array, you're gonna see some artifact in M1 array. So what is artifact versus what is actually a motor evoked responses? We do see some motor evoked responses. Um, um, but we haven't fully quanti quantified those. Any other questions right now? Okay, well, students who are too shy to ask, there's a lunch afterwards that you can feel free to jump in. Um, let's thank uh, Baloo again for uh, a great talk.